On behalf of Mining Your History Foundation, I would like to welcome all of you out to our genetic genealogy, DNA conference and workshops uh, here at the archives here today. Uh, Nancy, I need to go over the announcements. Okay. Uh, first, uh, the presenters for today. Uh, Cheryl Hartley is DNA detective, informal search angel, knowledgeable on Native American and other ethnicities, and expert on ancestry. Cheryl's been instrumental in finding biological parents for adoptees, uh, 20 at last count. We also have Allison Kessinger. Did I get that right? Kessinger. Experienced genealogist using both historical research and DNA. Uh, she has links there to a website. Uh, we also have Nancy Shiflett, our conference's organizer, a trained DAR volunteer, field genealogist. Nancy's first DNA test was in 2006 as a part of the National Geographic IBM Genome Project. Hooked from the start, Nancy has been searching for matches ever since. Uh, okay, our first lecture today will be uh, types of DNA, uh, DNA basics, testing companies, ancestry, family tree DNA, GEDmatch, heritage, DNA triangulation, mirror trees, leads, charts, wiki tree, lots of examples. Uh, we also have some announcements for today. Uh, there will be a 10% discount at the gift shop. So everybody stop in the gift shop and uh, buy you some West Virginia uh, trinkets. A lot of stuff from Tamarack you can get here in the gift shop. Uh, also, there will be a Mayflower Descendants luncheon on June 8th, and that's at Panera Bread. Uh, on the wall over there, there are some information. There's an information pamphlet with tear-offs that you can get for the Mayflower. Descendants luncheons. And basically for that you just go there and talk about how you connect your ancestry back to someone that came over on the Mayflower. And you can attempt to join the Mayflower Society if you can document your lineage back to an ancestor that came over on the Mayflower. Okay. You have interest in a group that meets, oh, would there be any interest in a group that meets at the archives to do genealogical research enhanced with DNA? Uh, Nancy has a sign-up sheet. And who is our first presenter? All right, Nancy. Um, our first presenter today for the first session between 10.05 and noon will be Nancy Shiflet. Thank you, Rick. All right, thanks for coming, everyone. Can you hear me fine? Great. Um, DNA, genetic genealogy. So the world of looking up your ancestors has really changed um, since DNA came out. And I'm going to cover some of the basics is there any way we can dim the lights a little? Thank you. Does that help? All right. DNA basics. There's three types of DNA testing you can do. And a lot of you have done ancestry, which is autosomal DNA. But there are other types. There's mitochondrial DNA called mtDNA, which is located outside the nucleus. You can see the little jelly beans over there. And that comes from your mother. To, the mother gives that to all her children, male and female. Autosomal DNA, chromosomes 1 through 22, are inside the nucleus. And you get about 50% from your mother and 50% from your father. YX DNA is the 23rd chromosome. And it's inside the nucleus. The father, who's an XY, the father determines the sex of the child. 
father, his next y provides his entire x to the daughter and his y to the son. Mother, whose double x, dos X, since we're close to Cinco de Mayo, provides about 50% to her children. So we look at the, uh, prior to fertilization, the mother's egg contains one copy of chromosomes 1 through 22, some or all of which may have recombined in a new way from DNA inherited from her parents. The X chromosome, which may have recombined from the DNA inherited from her parents. Remember, she has two Xs, but she only gives one. mtDNA inherited from her mother without recombination. The father... The sperm contains one copy of the, of the chromosomes, 1 through 22, some or all of which may have recombined in a new way, which he in, er, inherited from his parents. And he gives either an X or a Y chromosome, neither of which has recombined. The X comes directly from his mother, the Y coming directly from his father. Empty DNA inherited from his mother without recombination. So the father passes on those types of DNA, all of which can be tested. I also want to point out, if you look up on the upper right, the mom has two strips in colors, red and blue, and the dad has two strips in colors, orange and green. What we are going to refer to later as half identical matches and fully identical matches, that's You'll understand that if it comes up, that's what they're talking about. Do you match on one side or do you match on both sides? What does a match mean? Segments are markers that match a test taker. 99.9% .9 of our DNA is identical. There's only a tiny fraction that's different. So the testing companies are really looking for differences rather than how we're alike. They're looking for how we share differences with other people may require the same level of testing. There's different levels of testing in mtDNA and yDNA. Uh, genetic distance, how closely you match. If you're zero, you're usually close family, immediate family. Uh, if you're looking at the other types, you may be one, which could be 25 generations back. The uh, lower the genetic distance means the fewer generations to your most recent common ancestor. Haplogroup, haplogroup is the name we give to mtDNA and yDNA. So mtDNA haplogroups. You've all heard of Eve, correct? Well, the IBM project, and along with a lot of scientists, uh, took the mitochondrial Eve, which was haplogroup L, and it has m mutated through all the you know, many, many thousands of years into these other haplogroups that we share today. I, on my mtDNA test, I am haplogroup J. Probably after. All right, and we'll get into a lot of that in the workshops. That's the best place where we can answer the questions. Um, MTA haplogroup matching, an exact match on FMS, which is full mitochondrial sequencing which is the big test for women. It's going to see if you match someone five to 20 generations ago, but it's difficult, difficult, difficult to find matches with the most recent common ancestor that will do you any good at all. I had the test done in 2006. I have no exact matches other than my sister and my mother's first cousin, which I already knew. Now the test has come down a lot in price. It's only like $200 now but it used to be very expensive. So if you're looking to find something with mitochondrial DNA test, then it can help you rule out things, but it can hardly ever rule you in. But yeah, that said, I am J1C3B1A. That's my label. And mtDNA looks at heteroplasmies, difference in heteroplasmies. How it can help you is, I had my family tree on Wikitree. I love Wikitree. And I thought one of my direct maternal ancestors was last, last name was Boggs. But on Wikitree, if you can see the red mark there by Nancy Gill, that's my maiden name, 
that's my mitochondrial DNA test and which haplogroup I'm in. Well, someone else had a really good tree and that Boggs person did not share that same haplogroup with me. So I knew either my tree was wrong or her tree was wrong. Well, my tree was wrong. I now know my person was Sarah Jane Frame, not Sarah Boggs, all right? Because on the, you know, I knew her name was Sarah, I just didn't know what her last name was. So that's how mtDNA can help you, can help you eliminate. Mutations in mtDNA rarely occur, but they can occur as the mtDNA gets copied. Matches can be recent or prehistoric. Low, medium, and high level testing, there's H HVR1, HVR1 and 2, and full mitochondrial sequencing. Those are the three types of maternal DNA testing. So the fertilized egg contains 23 pairs of chromosomes with the mtDNA inherited from the mother. Then you grow up and you get your DNA tested. Then you get the results back and you say, what? You know? <laughs> so we're here to help you with that today. Your DNA looks like a ladder. The rungs are numbered from beginning one with being one. The rungs consist of two joining sides. This is where if you match on both sides, you're fully identical. If you match on one side, you're half identical, all right? And like I said, the testing companies are looking at differences where you're different, not where you're alike. So each rung contains a nucleotide base pair. The variations, what the testing companies look for, are, are single nucleotide polymorphisms, pronounced SNP. Another variation that they look for is short tandem repeat. And that's how many times certain chemicals join up in a group. And so like GATA is repeated how many times in your DNA. And they'll look for that. So SNPs and STRs are the markers. They compare them for matches and mismatches. Y-DNA, which John's going to talk about, uh, comes directly from the father to his sons and those sons to their sons. And the STR tests, 3767 or 111 markers for men, and now there's Y full. There's a lot more. Autosomal DNA, 23 pair of chromosomes. Currently only SNP tests are used by the major companies. This is where they get your estimate of ethnicity, all right? It identifies shared segments. The X chromosome, male has one, female has two, is approximately 156 million base pairs long. That's why they look for the differences and not what we share alike. It's useful because of its unique inheritance patterns. It helps narrow your line of investigation. It can narrow it a lot. If you're going to compare on your X chromosome, that's your 23rd chromosome, criteria for X chromosome matches. For half identical regions, Male versus male, you only need to look at 200 SNPs or one centimorgan. And a centimorgan is a, a measure, but it's not distance. It's how often uh, the nucleotide may vary uh, in 100th, 100th variance in a, specific, in a single generation. So male versus female, you have to look at six centimorgans and 600 SNPs. Female to female, 1,200 SNPs and six centimorgans. That's because female to female, we've both inherited half of, of what, uh, of the xDNA that we receive. So here's how that helps you to eliminate. In the collar chart, only the people who have the collars, if you filled this out with your mother being the first pink area near the person and your father being the blue area, if you found a, X, a match on your X 23rd chromosome, you would only need to look down those lines because that's the only place this woman could have inherited that section on your X chromosome. For men, much easier, all right? Because they inherit Y. So a, a male can only inherit his X chromosome from his mother. So he only has to look a lot fewer places. So he ha if he has a match on his X chromosome, he just looks for the ancestors that would be on the wheel back from that. GEDmatch. How many of you have heard of GEDmatch? All right. 
GEDmatch is a volunteer organization. Uh, they provide a lot of free tools. You have a lot of really, really highly skilled and trained professionals who volunteer at, for GEDmatch. It has many tools for analyzing your results. It finds all your matches across the entire database. And you can upload from Family Tree, from Ancestry, from 23andMe, you can upload your DNA, your autosomal DNA, to GEDmatch. And so that's how, across all the testing companies, you can try to find your matches. It has tools to compare matches one to one. It has tier one tools, which you must donate money to have those open up to you. It's $10 a month to use it for one month, $10. So decide what you're going to need, send them 10 bucks, and then download it all. <laughs> then you don't have to pay it again. Um, and it has a tier one tool to do triangulation groups. I personally am into triangulation groups. This is a screenshot of GEDmatch. GEDmatch is changing. It's now going to GEDmatch Genesis. It's been there for a while. But June 1st, I think, is the deadline that um, they're going to have the new GEDmatch uh, Genesis. So I didn't even bother to take a photo because I was told it's going to change. But GEDmatch.com is where you would go. These are the tools. And you can see over there the triangulation groups on your right. So what is a triangulation group? All right. I'm looking down on a chromosome browser, which allows you to look at your chromosomes and do comparisons. And I find that A matches B on chromosome 4 from 119 to 220. A matches C on chromosome 4, 119 to 220. All right, so all three of us match on that chromosome for that area. But what I then find out is C doesn't match B. All right, B doesn't match C. So that means even though I match all three of them on that exact chromosome, it's a half identical match because the other person matches me on the other side of the DNA ladder run. But the good thing is, traditional genealogy. You want to have a paper trail for at least two of your triangulation group members. That way you can prove through your DNA test that you are a descendant of this specific most recent common ancestry pair. All right. DNA ethics. This applies if you're helping someone. It also applies to yourself. Okay? Be sensitive. Your DNA results may have an emotional impact. Everyone has a right to consent or refuse a DNA test. Be open-minded. 99.9% .9 of our DNA is identical. Be kind. Unexpected test results require consideration, diplomacy, and tact. Be unemotional and unbiased. Just look at the facts. Remember, this applies to you. Don't get emotional. Just see what it says. Okay? Be aware. Once you know something, you can't unknow it. All right? Find out how your DNA testing or DNA sharing company will use your data. All right? If you really want everything private, then you have to think twice before where you upload your DNA to. DNA ethics. The GINA Act Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act passed in the U.S. in 2008. It protects you from either your health insurer or your employer using your DNA for discrimination. But it does not cover life insurance, disability insurance, and long-term care insurance. So if you have testing done, say with a medical facility or Prometheus, and you find out something, and you say, well, I need, I need long-term care insurance, if they find out you tested and knew you needed it, then you can't unknow what you know. Some states have their own laws. I checked with West Virginia this week, and they have one where they can mandatory make you give your DNA if you have committed certain crimes. So my conclusion, DNA alone seldom provides an answer to a genealogical question. You're going to have to do some of the footwork. It can augment and help prove a familial connection. Right? That's, these are my sources, and I have a sources handout that I'll give to you later. All right? And that concludes my presentation. I think John is up next for YDNA.
it's interesting to me that Nancy mentioned the National Geographic DNA situation back in 2006 because you, you got to kind of get a perspective of when people were using DNA for this purpose. And that's, I guess, Nancy, one of the earliest major projects in DNA, is that correct? Okay, well, I got into DNA in 2010, which, again, is uh, the way things have happened is a long time ago. Uh, and uh, what I'm gonna talk about a little bit is some of my personal experiences. Now, this is both autosomal and Y, but primarily Y. I managed 10 different accounts on GEDmatch. In other words, I have been asked by people to do the research on them, so I have access to the, the DNA on 10 different people on GEDmatch. Uh, I manage almost that many on family tree DNA and several on ancestry DNA. I had an ancestor named Arthur McClure who died in Greenbrier County in 1800. He had 12 children, six males and six females. And I had done a lot of traditional genealogical research on the McClure family. Uh, in that research, I contacted a person who appeared to be another descendant of Arthur back in 2002. And we had exchanged hundreds of emails. So around 2009, we started talking about DNA testing because it looked like something we needed to do. This cousin, distant cousin of mine had been contacted by a man who was assisting someone whose name was Newman, but he suspected that he was a McClure. Uh, so the person he was working with and I were both tested and we matched. Well, the other presenters can tell you that the male line, you expect to see the same surname, but it doesn't always happen. In this particular case, two of Arthur's sons had left Greenbrier County in the early 1800s to go to Jackson County, Ohio. Uh, one of the, one, my ancestor was John, the other was Samuel. One of Samuel's descendants got in trouble with the law and left town and became a Newman, a new man. <laughs> so those sort of things happen and, and the other presenters can talk more about their experiences with adoption than I can, but I have worked with several people on that. Um, there are surname projects on Y-DNA and I have been in the McClure DNA project for many years. Um, what happened was the people who were running the McClure project got old like me and decided they couldn't do it anymore. So it's on hold right now. The data is still available, but nobody's running the project. So you can't contact anybody. Um, now, uh, in addition to doing the Y-DNA in 2010, and that was 37 markers. So what you've got now is on Y, you can test at various levels. On autosomal, you basically just test once, but Y, you can test at various levels and pay different amounts. So I did 37, stepped up to 67, stepped up to 111. There is a big Y now, which I guess is 700, and the last figure I had, it's another $349. You can invest a lot of money in this if you're really interested. And then uh, I got into Family Finder, which is Otto Sonwell, back in 2013. Um, another piece of information on why, uh, at those various testing levels, they have criteria for matches that the experts have established. So. 
if you look at 12 markers, which is not very much of the Y-DNA to look at, I have 101 matches. If you go to 25, I have 139 matches. Now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. 37, I have 59 matches. 67 markers, I have 49 matches. But 111 markers, which is the highest that they were doing, I had 14 matches. In other words, I had 14 very, very good matches. I have one person who is a match at 107 out of 111 markers. And there is some uh, mutation that on some of the markers takes place. So you don't get much better than 107 out of 111. This particular person, we've been on a mailing list and he forgets when he's doing his lodge work and he mails me because he has another name on his mailing list that something like mine. So I keep writing to him, Gary, you sent that stuff to me again. <laughs> but uh, we are a very good match. Uh, now, why DNA can help confirm a relationship, but it also can show uh, evidence that a relationship does not occur. Uh, I just had a conversation with a woman who's a uh, descendant of Richard Renshaw McClure, and if you know the McClures of Lincoln County, Boone County, uh, Lawrence County, Ohio, Lawrence County, Kentucky, those are mostly Richard Renshaw and McClure people. Mine are Arthur, and Arthur's descendants and Richard Renshaw's descendants are not good matches on DNA. In the McClure project, they have probably 20 categories of matches that all have the McClure surname, but aren't necessarily all that closely related. Now, my uncle and his wife did years and years of research on his ancestors. As a matter of fact, his wife started doing genealogy when she, she was 16, and she died at 103 years and 10 months, and she still was paying a little bit, a bit of attention to genealogy at that point. So that's a long career in doing that. And just a little aside point, we're sitting at her dining room table on Thanksgiving, and she had been a mother and a housewife, and she'd done a lot of genealogy publication, but uh, never really worked for, for money. Uh, so she was saying to her family, my obituary is not going to look very good because I have never done anything. Well, the family all knew that she produced all this research. So we, we looked at that differently. But her son said, no, mother, your obituary will read that you had three fine children, each one finer than the one before. <laughs> Obviously, you know how, which one he was. Um, but they had done that research and I had gone over some of their research because I had tools because I started later that they didn't have when they did. So I had validated the family tree in some cases and even found some more. Uh, and I had done the Y DNA and I asked my cousin, I said, why don't you represent that side of the family and let's do a Y DNA test on you. Well, he did a Y DNA test. He got one match at 37 markers, which is almost unheard of. And that match was not with the family name. So now we don't know one eighth of our family tree as far as having any confidence that that's what are really our biological ancestors. So it works both ways. It can help confirm a relationship. It can give you quest, uh, reason to question what the family said. And adoptions are a good part of that. There are adoptions that have been made and nobody in the family has been told about it. So you have an assumption about a biological relationship that doesn't exist. <laughs>
So you got to be real careful about that. Now, this cousin of mine matched our close relatives on Otto Sungwell. So we know that we are related, but we don't have that family tree for any of us, that part of the family tree. And, and I've looked on Otto Sommel for the surnames of the people who should be in the family tree. And I never get matches, and the other people in the family don't get matches on those surnames. So something happened there. It could have been an adoption. It could have been something else. But uh, you, the, to me, the YD, well, yeah, in this case, the YDNA and also Otto Sommel can cause you to question all these very precise records, which is what we had. They just may not be a fact. Now, on Otto Zomel, this thing off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did he lose his battery, you think? I don't know. Did you see him? I didn't see him touch anything, so I don't know what. <laughs> well, can you hear me? Yeah. People in the back. Yeah. Um, well, I'll finish up here and Randy will work on getting the battery replaced. Uh, on Otto Cinemal, as Nancy indicated, it dropped off from each generation. I did a family finder, which is family tree DNA, and an ancestry Otto Cinemal test. So I got 3587 as the number of centimorgans that I matched myself on which is about what you'd expect. So you expect each generation from a common ancestor to pretty much drop in half. My niece and my nephew are about half of my value when they are compared to me. My nephew's daughters are about half of his, which makes sense. Uh, two of my cousins, are about a fourth of us. Are we back? <laughs> All right. Yeah, we're back. Um, so that's the kind of thing you look for. But what that leads you to is that when you go very many generations on an on autosomal, it gets very chancy. I don't know what everybody else uses, but I don't get very excited about any centimorgan number lower than 20 if you've done autosomal testing. I find that generally I don't have a clue as to who this person is based on everything I know about our family. Uh, I've ha had some that were known relatives at 15 and 10, but my attitude is it's not usually worth me looking at number total number of centimorgans under 20. I, I don't know what everybody else's experience, but that is my experience. Uh, now, the other presenters can probably tell you some things you ought to read, and they may disagree with me on this, but I'll leave this on the desk. It's the Family Tree Guide to DNA Testing and Genetic Genealogy by B Blaine Bettinger. Nancy, would you agree that he's an authority on this? He is an authority, and his book is here in the archives. Okay, good. So it, this was $30, and I don't understand all of it. Chances are you won't uh, understand all of it, but it'll certainly be helpful to you if you get this and read it. And, there are other sources uh, of that kind of information. Uh, that's pretty much what I had, and I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions after uh, we'll do the whole 
That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Fresh battery now. Fresh battery. <laughs> All right. All right. Our next speaker is Allison Kissinger, right? And Allison's big in ancestry, I think. Ancestry. Most of you tested with it. How many tested with ancestry? Yeah, that's a lot of you. Here's your, this takes your slides forward. Do you have a pocket? Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Do you need help with this? Or, uh, so I get it. Okay. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay. All right, so I will be speaking today about confirming connections with DNA. Um, so this is a combination of traditional research and DNA research. Um, so a quick overview, we're going to identify your research goals, uh, help identify a possible ancestor, both starting with traditional research and starting with DNA alone, and then confirming a possible ancestor with your DNA results, and then confirming a DNA match with traditional research. Now, this first part, I realize that many of you are already experienced traditional genealogists, so I'm just going to skim very quickly. Um, but basically, you need to have a specific goal in mind when researching. So an example of that might be, I want to find the maiden name of Isabel, who was the wife of William Atkins. That one has given me a lot of trouble over the years. <laughs> or I want to find the names of the parents of John Wright. So broad research goals that you don't want to have when looking for something specific are things like, I want to find out how I'm related to all of my fourth cousins or closer, or I want to find all ancestors of a specific person. I mean, those are great goals to have, but it can be very overwhelming when you try to look at it the whole picture at once. Um, so once you've identified your research goal, it's really important to keep careful records of your work. And I do have a handout for you that will help that make that a little bit easier. You also want to keep a list of all sources that you've already consulted. Um, so this is the record checklist that I'm going to give you. Now, I cannot take credit for this. I found this on a Facebook genealogy group, um, but it has a wide variety of things there, uh, birth records, death records, census, marriage, military, all that kind of thing on there. Um, as far as keeping annotations and records of your work is concerned, I would recommend using the Turabian Manual for Writers. And I am a musician by trade. I'm the choir director at East Bank Middle School and I have a master's degree in music. And this is the citation source that we used for music. And I find that it's very good for genealogy as well. It's very thorough. Okay, so uh, getting on to the main event here. Starting with a possible ancestor. So when you start with traditional research, you wanna look for written records that will help point you in the right direction. So for example, if you're looking for the parents of a specific ancestor, um, try searching census records for people living in the same area with the same last name. It's been my experience that people often, at least in those days, they married people who lived close to them. So if you're looking for you know, the parents of a, of a wife that you know made a name for, which we'll look at here in a minute, then you will usually find her parents living close to his. Um, so as an example here, oh, another example would be to check the names of children for clues as to what the wife's maiden name might have been. So two of my ancestors were William Walter and Patience Clark, and then they had a son named Clark Walter. Okay, so starting with traditional research, we're going to look here at, the, um, at finding somebody with, or using DNA to confirm somebody that you already suspect is an ancestor based on traditional research. So in this case, it's Melinda White. We're gonna find her parents. She was my fifth great-grandmother. She was born in August 1819, and she married Jesse Leftwich on July 5th, 1838, and died after the 1900 census. Um, so I knew from her marriage record that she had married Jesse when she was about 18 years old, and I already knew from other records that Jesse was the son of James Leftwich and Mary Hicks. Um, Jess, or James and his family were living in Canal County, what, what was then Virginia, in 1830, 
and they worked in the salt mines at Malden. Um, so I figured odds were good that Melinda's family lived close to Jesse's, and so I did a search of the 1830 census for people in Canal County whose last name were, was White. Now, before 1850, it was only uh, the heads of family that were recorded. They did not record the names of like the wife or if the husband had passed away, the husband and the children. At that point, it was only heads of family. So I found three results for White in Canal County. We found Justin, William, and Nathaniel. So Justin White had no daughters at all in the 1830 census. And if you look, um, the horizontal line there is Justin, and then they did record like the number of children that they had and the number of people living in the household. So if you see the two horizontal lines there, those are like daughters under the age of about 15, I believe. And so Justin did not have any daughters that could have been Melinda. William White had only one daughter in 1830, but she was under the age of five years, which you can see by the, the intersection of the, the three lines there. And um, so oh, obviously that was too young to be Melinda, so it couldn't have been William. Now Nathaniel did have a daughter of the correct age to be Melinda, and you can see uh, there's a, a little tick mark there where Melinda should be. So once I suspected that Nathaniel White was Melinda's father, I, uh, start, I just did a Google search for him and see if anybody had researched him before. So I was in luck, somebody had. Um, I found up another researcher's results on Roots Web and she had clearly been working on this line for a long time. She had pulled many sources from, uh, from various locations and everything and she had pieced together pretty much everybody in the family. So according to the obituary of Montville White, who would have been one of Melinda's brothers. It said that he was the youngest of 10 children. So the researcher accounted for Montville and the eight other children, but she said, I have no idea who the 10th child might be. So that was an excellent indication that I had the correct family. Um, my late great-grandfather's sister, Margaret, was the closest person uh, to Melinda that I had tested. So Melinda was my fifth great-grandmother, but she was only Margaret's second great-grandmother. So Margaret's test told me a whole lot more about that family than mine would have. So um, I did a search through Margaret's matches. Now I had to do this one at a time, looking at all the, all the trees and finding uh, you know, the Nathaniel White matches and everything. But now the new through lines feature makes this a whole lot easier. Because what it does, it takes your ancestor and then it shows you all the DNA matches that you have or it suspects that you have that are descended from that person. So you can see over here where it says Margaret Hunt Douglas, that's my aunt. And then here she had like 16 matches that were not also descended from Melinda that descend from Nathaniel. So that basically confirmed for me because of those 16 matches, that can't be a coincidence combined with our other research that showed that uh, in all likelihood Nathaniel was her father. Okay, so that, now we've looked at, we've already looked at identifying an ancestor when you start with traditional research. Now we're going to identify one where you start with nothing but a DNA match. So first you need to isolate the line that the DNA match is in using common matches. When you find DNA matches that descend from the immediate family of the, po or I'm sorry, excuse me, then you need to find DNA matches that descend from the immediate family of the possible ancestor, so like their parents and their grandparents. And then you try to confirm this as much as you can with supporting evidence. Now, obviously, you won't always be able to do this, but it's helpful when you can. All right, so our next case study is going to be finding the father of Clara Campbell. Clara was my great-grandmother. Okay? She was born October 6, 1906 in Agate, Colorado. She married James Abram Garfield Quinn on December 8, 1943. Um, that was the actual date of their marriage. They were together long before that, actually. And then um, she died on November 5th, 1989. All right, so it was common knowledge in my family that Clara was not William Campbell's father, or, well, excuse me, that she was not his daughter. They, um, he adopted her basically like unofficially when she was a small child. Um, several possible suggestions were given for who her biological father might be, including that he might possibly be a man named Schofield, but they didn't know for sure. 
And because I only had a possible last name to go on, it took me several months of researching after using traditional research for seven years before I could even begin to narrow down the possibilities. So I did my DNA test first, and I didn't get very far, okay? Then I tested both of my parents. So after that happened, this match came up. He was a man named Robert, and he had Schofields in his tree. So again, I wasn't completely sure that I was looking for the name Schofield at this point. So I was just kind of going through matches and trying to identify ones that I didn't match with on any other name. But I saw on my mother's DNA test that Robert also matched me, and then he matched three of my second cousins, who are great-grandchildren of Clara, just like I am. Um, so then I looked at his tree, and I figured, okay, this has to be it. This, these four matches, five matches, combined with, with um, the fact that he has Schofield in his tree, it can't be a coincidence. So um, I looked at his tree, and I found three men that were possibilities. The first was his own grandfather, who was Joseph Schofield. But then I said, okay, in the spirit of being thorough, we'll, we'll have to include his great uncle, Joseph's brother, Timothy, as well as his great grandfather, who was their father, George. Okay. So I contacted him, and I learned that you have to do this very delicately, because in researching previously, trying to research this line, most people said, sure, I'll help you in any way I can. But then I encountered a few who didn't appreciate me insinuating that one of their more recent ancestors had had an affair. <laughs> so uh, you got to do this very, very delicately. So when I wrote to him, I told him, like, I suspect that your grandfather was my great grandmother's father, but it could also have been um, his brother or his father. And uh, it turns out that Robert actually didn't know very much about his grandfather because he, his grandfather had mostly been absent from his mother's life from a young age. But he was able to tell me one very important piece of information, and that was that Joseph traveled with a rodeo. He said he traveled the rodeo circuit. Because, and the reason why this was important was because the Schofield family, like Robert's family, lived in Oregon. And my great-great-great-great-grandmother was from Ohio. So I was like, how on earth did they even meet? They lived in Oregon, she lived in Ohio. Like, how does this fit together? So I knew from a city directory that Clara's mother's family was living in Zanesville, Ohio at the time that Clara would have been conceived. And I searched the Zanesville Time Recorder for articles with the words Rodeo and Wild West Show, and I found one. It was, <laughs> it was Pawnee Bill's Wild West Show, and they were wintering in the neighboring county of Noble County, Ohio, which was about 20 miles from Zanesville. So um, if you have ever seen anything about like the old circuses or Wild West shows, it was a big operation. They had their own train, they had a little tent city that they set up, they traveled with buffaloes, elephants, camels, um, like hundreds of people, like it was a big, big production. So they would have had their own little miniature city that they set up, but of course, since they were wintering there, they would have been there for several months. So they would have made trips to the neighboring city of Zanesville. So they were there from November of 1905 to probably about February, March, 1906, and then Clara was born in October of 1906. And then they, so they did a performance also on September 15th, 1906, which is only three weeks before Clara was born. So once I believed that I had it narrowed down to Joseph, I searched the DNA matches that descend from his four grandparents, who were the, the Schofields, and then his mother's family, who were the Dotsons. Um, so I found several Dotson matches, which eliminated the possibility that George, who was Joseph's father, was Clara's father. So I knew it had to be, you know, the person that was her father had to be descended from both Schofields and Dotsons. Um, so that narrowed it down specifically. That meant it had to be either Joseph or Timothy. And again, I had to do this one at a time. However, the through lines feature that Ancestry just rolled out made this a whole lot easier if you are going to do this. All right, so this over here is Joseph, who was my great-great-grandfather. And the first time I saw that picture, I actually cried because I was so, I had spent so much time looking for him and I was finally getting to see him. But based on the DNA evidence and the documentary evidence, it can be concluded that Joseph was Clara's father. So of the three initial possibilities, he's one of two who descend from both Schofields and Dotsons. Um, his grandson, Robert, mentioned that he traveled the rodeo, and that fit the evidence there. 
a rodeo from the western U.S. where Joseph's family lived um, was in the area where Clara's mother lived at the time that she would have conceived. And one thing I forgot to put on here, one of my cousins who uh, descended from one of Clara's brothers, she mentioned to me, she said, you know, my grandmother used to brag that she had been to almost every, every one of the 50 states. And I couldn't figure out how she did that. Well, she traveled on their circus train with them is how she did it. All right, so in summary, when using DNA for genealogical research, the results are far more compelling when documentary evidence can be found to support the DNA findings. And you will have better results also if you test um, multiple generations of your family. So I've had four, four generations of my family tested. If you don't immediately get the answers that you're looking for, keep working because DNA doesn't lie and eventually it will tell its truth. Thank you. I saw that a lot of you have tested with Ancestry, and that's great. I hope my presentation isn't going to be too basic for you, but since Ancestry has changed so much in the last, I don't know when they rolled the, the new uh, changes out. Does anybody remember? Has it been about six weeks or, or maybe eight weeks? Yeah, but it, it hasn't been very long, and it keeps changing. So. We're going to take a whirlwind tour of Ancestry DNA, and hopefully if, uh, if most of these things are things that you already know, I may be able to give you a few tips and tricks on things that you might not have known about. Uh, I believe that only because I'm always finding things that I don't know about, and I'm a very, very heavy Ancestry user. I'm on Ancestry a minimum of a half an hour a day, possibly up to six hours a day. So <laughs> and the reason is, I've been, a, I've been a traditional genealogical researcher for over 25 years, but the last, year, the last five years I began uh, using it to identify where in Germany my German ancestors came from. When I, when I started, I didn't know, uh, I only knew where two of them had originated. I have originated. I've now identified all of the places that they came from. So uh, that's not what this is going to be about, but we can talk about that later. Okay, so if there's anybody who hasn't tested, or if you need validation for why you tested with Ancestry, uh, why test with Ancestry compared to the other major testing companies? One is the size of the Ancestry database. They claim to have tested over 10 million people. And the important thing you want is you want to get matches. Um, they are the largest consumer testing service in the world. Also, Ancestry DNA is portable. What do I mean by that? You can download your raw DNA. How many people have done this? Okay, a good number of you know how to do that. Raw DNA, for those of you who don't know, is not something gushy that you can hold in your hands. <laughs> it's actually a file, and it comes down to your computer in the form of a zip file, and then you later upload it to other testing services. Ancestry does not allow you to download raw DNA from another testing service. So this is one of the reasons that CC Moore of DNA Detectives recommends that people start with Ancestry tests. Now the other thing is the cost. Ancestry, um, I think they're claiming their list price now is $99. That's what it sells for on Amazon. Uh, I had a woman in England who asked me to receive an Ancestry DNA test and send it to a relative in the United States, and I agreed to do this for her. I was horrified when I learned that she paid $99 for it. Uh, they run so many sales, and uh, last week uh, the price was, I think, $79. Uh, three days ago, while I was working on the presentation, I heard an ad on television, and they were announcing their Mother's Day sale. So it's $59 right now, and uh, usually about $10 shipping. Occasionally, if you're one of those online coupon hunters, sometimes you can find a free shipping coupon, 
and uh, in the past I've been able to double up the sale and the free shipping. So. Okay, the other thing uh, is that Ancestry does sell uh, kits, uh, testing kits, all over the world. When I was here in November, one of my biggest complaints to everybody was that they weren't selling kits in Germany. So that was a, a huge drawback. But in December, they changed that. They've now added Germany to the list of places that they're selling. And um, in January, I got a message. Um, someone had matched with my husband's DNA. Not only had she matched, but she knew exactly how they were related. And she was able to give me more information on that particular line than I already had. And I trust her research a lot more because she's living in Germany. She's a German and she has access to the records that I may not necessarily have access to. And then even more interestingly, she was on GEDmatch, and we started comparing on GEDmatch, and she said, hey, guess what, Cousin Cheryl, not only do I match your, your husband, but uh, you match my father. <laughs> <laughs> now, so far, I don't think my husband and I are related, but... <laughs> Maybe if you go far enough back. We haven't figured out that connection yet. Um, but what's the main reason that I like Ancestry? It's all the trees. And um, I have a thing, I don't know who coined the phrase, but I like to do quick and dirty trees. Rather than one of the biggest complaints I hear from people is that they send messages out to their matches and then they never hear anything back. In most cases, I never even try to reach those people. The only time I will message somebody is if I can't figure it out on my own. So I have a separate family tree. Well, actually, I have multiple separate family trees, DNA trees, that I use to do little mini trees within that tree uh, they don't necessarily connect to anybody. They're just quick and dirty trees. You get onto Ancestry. You search for a name that you might find in somebody's tree. You say, okay, who looks like they might be the most likely connection? You know, if one side of the family is Italian and the other side of the family is German, I'm going to be looking at the German side, not the Italian side. Uh, those kinds of things are obvious. But sometimes I'll get in there and then I'll start looking, well, where did their relatives live, location? Um, by the way, I loved Allison's story uh, where she was talking about, about her ancestor being with the rodeo. Yes, you have to get two people together in order to create the next generation. <laughs> so proximity is extremely important. So anyway, um, we know that there are a lot of really, really bad trees on Ancestry. But there's also a lot of information that you can't find anywhere else. Somebody may just have family history knowledge that's been passed down to them, you know? And so we can't discount that. We have to at least, no, it may not be proof, but boy, it, it can sometimes be a heck of a clue. So I like to really um, investigate some of those trees that for all intents and purposes may not be the greatest genealogical work on earth, but they might have some significant information in them. So don't, uh, you know, don't turn up your nose at them. The drawbacks of testing with Ancestry. There are, are many. Uh, there's no chromosome browser and uh, you'll need to upload to GEDmatch or one of the other um, uh, services that includes that. Ancestry's marketing. Up until maybe about a year ago, they shifted a bit, but they were doing, you notice, heavy, heavy, heavy marketing to people who just wanted to know their ethnicity. And Ancestry, I don't think they really care why they, you know, why they sell the DNA test. They are all about the money. There's no doubt about that. So those people who just tested for ethnicity, they don't put up a tree. They, um, 
they don't even necessarily ever log in again. They look, they go, oh, no Native American DNA, and they're done, and they're over. It's, you know. <laughs> and of course, maintaining a subscription can be very expensive. Uh, and without a subscription, you're not going to have access to all of the features that I'm going to talk about today. And then, just when you get used to using Ancestry and you feel really comfortable with it, they change a feature and their beta versions tend to be very, very buggy, which I'm sure you've all experienced lately. So, this is the new opening screen, or at least the way I see it on my PC or my laptop. You may see it differently if you're on, um, on a phone. And uh, I understand that, they, uh, that Ancestry actually rolls out a lot of their um, newer features on phones rather than doing it for the PC first. So, a couple of things that I'm going to point out on this screen. Oh, oops, I forgot to move along to the next screen. A <laughs> couple of things that I'm going to point out. Uh, you all know where through lines is. It's circled down there. But I want you to pay attention. If you haven't already done this, you need to go to extras up, up there in the corner, or up sort of in the left-hand side, and know where that settings button is, because that's extremely important. Now, under extras, if you haven't gone there to uh, Ancestry Lab, you scroll down from extras, and you choose Ancestry Lab. And there are two new things there. They must be enabled before you're going to get the new features. So some of you may be wondering, well, I've seen through lines, but people are talking about some things that I just haven't seen. There's my tree tags, and there's new and improved DNA matches. Turn them both on. Now, a tip is, that you can actually turn them off again, at least for now. So if there's something that you uh, don't like about the new features and you want to go back and access some of the old features, you can actually turn this off, get your old features back, use them, and go back and toggle the, uh, the new features back on. And I did a little test last night because I wasn't sure, because I don't want to be standing here recommending you turn things off and then you go back and it wipes out all your user defined features. But I was able to, when I turned it off, the features went away, but my, when I turned it back on, those tags that I had created for my tree tags were still there. Whew. So um, I think I feel pretty comfortable saying that you can move back and forth. Okay, so tree tags, what do they look like? Um, they show up in a place, uh, they're, they're little blue tags like that, and when you click on, on one, it pops up your workspace. This is, this is new because it includes the tree tags, some are predefined, and others you can define yourself. So. There's three on there for DNA, but you can make up any one, any kind you want. Uh, I do a lot of searching for biological parents, for um, adoptees, and sometimes um, what we call MPEs, misattributed parents. And uh, so, in my quick and dirty trees, I'll be researching somebody, and all of a sudden I'll realize, hmm, this one's not the one. So I've now created a tag that says, not the one. <laughs> <laughs> that way, when I've forgotten that I already looked at the, the 25th John Smith, and actually, I was actually working on a John Smith a few weeks ago. Uh, I can go back and say, oh yeah, I already researched this guy. I don't need to spend any more time on him. So, uh, but they're not only just related to DNA. You can have reference tags, research tags. Another one that I like to use is uh, no children. Because if I'm trying to, if I'm back, you know, four or five generations and I, you know, I go back and I look at one of my families, 
can, I'll say. Oh, why didn't I ever find the children for, you know, for Frank Stephan? And then I go, oh, wait a minute. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't have any children. So it's, it's nice to have those, those kinds of tags to, to use. Now, I also pointed out the settings to you. A lot of people tend to ignore their settings. And it's, um, it's something that you should be aware of. Uh, partly because this is how your DNA is going to show up to your matches. So, for example, if you don't want your real name attached to your DNA for some reason, you have the opportunity to go in there um, and, and change your display name. So rather than, I display my real name, but I have cousins, like I have one, I have no idea who this person is, They're, they show up as Ohio Cherry Pie. You know, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can, and use something, if you really want to be anonymous, make sure you use something that you haven't used as an email address, say. Um, family tree linking. This is really important, too. If, if you're one of those people who've gone to your tree and it says, no through lines, is there anybody in here who's had that? Okay, well that's good. You all feel like you're linked to your family tree in the right way? Very good. Because family tree linking is extremely important. You're not going to, uh, and the other thing that's important for your through lines is you must have a, either a, a public or a private searchable database. So if you've made your, your, your uh, tree, if you've made your tree private, and you've decided you won't want it to be found in searches, guess what? You're not going to get any through lines. And if, if you're helping somebody else, that may be something that you want to look at if, they, if they're complaining about not getting through lines. Um, this is where you go to download your raw DNA. Then as you scroll down further on the screen, this is where you share with people. And, um, you may wonder, well, why do I want to share my information? But at some point, you're going to want somebody to share their information with you, so it's a good idea to offer to share back with them. This can be done by um, email or by Ancestry username, but be aware that a lot of times the screen name that shows up on Ancestry is not actually their username. So. I just find it easier to invite people by ask them for their email address. And then you can move your conversations to email anyway. And don't forget to assign the level of, um, of uh, uh, collaboration that you want. Do you want them to just be able to view the test results? Do you want them to be able to leave notes there and star matches? So that's all set here in settings at the bottom of the page. And I definitely do not recommend making them a manager because then they will also get your messages and, um, and have all kinds of other control over your account. But I guess if you need to, you know, it, I suppose it's possible. I manage also about 10 DNA kits for people, tests for people. And at some point I keep thinking, well, a few of these people, I should probably just pass it along to them. So I could move them to being the managers of their own information. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, if you want to uh, then go and see who you've shared with and view their tests, once you're sharing with people next to settings, you're going to have that view another test, and then a whole, if you have a lot of people, a whole list of people whose tests you're also able to look at. That's where it's going to show up. Okay, through lines. When you open your through lines, you're going to see all of the ancestors, all of the direct ancestors that are in your tree. So it's all based. It's really all based on trees. Um, if you haven't, again, if you haven't attached your tree to your DNA settings, you're not going to have through lines. And if it's not public and searchable, 
you're not going to have three lives. So this is when I click on one of my ancestors, I picked uh, Johannes Greiner because I know that I have a lot of DNA matches. And actually, I know that I have a lot more DNA matches than are shown here. These are just the people that have trees and they don't necessarily all have Johannes Greiner in their trees though. Uh, sometimes, if you start exploring these matches, you might discover that you have someone in your tree, uh, for example, uh, the DNA matches to Frederick Greiner. They may only go back to Frederick Greiner, but they've not made that connection to Johannes Greiner. Uh, and the situation could, of course, be reversed. So there are people who are finding things in their trees where someone has an ancestor that didn't appear in their trees. So this is sort of an artificial intelligence that Ancestry has created that's trying to link people together even though it may not have been immediately obvious to you what the connection is. And again, uh, Allison talked about the validation of seeing so many matches. And, you know, I have, uh, I have uh, 12 DNA matches that come down through Peter Lewis, nine from Frederick, uh, nine from Katharina, and uh, three from, from Casper. But you must keep in mind that these are really just hints only. So don't be shocked if you find that, uh, that some, some of these are just completely bogus. Um, I felt kind of embarrassed because I got a through lines hint for somebody that I thought was the ancestor of my, the father of my third great grandmother. Well, for a long time I thought that this particular individual was her father and I added him to the tree. Eventually, I disproved it. Well, he's still out there floating around in ancestry trees because so many people have copied from me. And now he's coming back to haunt me <laughs> as a hint, <laughs> as a, a through lines hint. So, um, these kinds of things are unavoidable, but it does just go to show that through lines as a standalone is not the proof. All it is is the starting point, and you still have to go in, see whether these people actually match you on that line. It's very possible that they match you in some completely different way. Oh, and. Uh, is everybody seeing a lot of mistakes in through lines? How many are seeing a lot of errors in through lines? Yeah. Do people, are people experiencing improvement? Yeah, okay. Because uh, I know when I first, first looked at through lines, I was going crazy. And not only am I looking at my through lines, but I'm looking at the through lines for all of the people who are looking for biological family and looking at their through lines. Uh, my through lines for the longest time wouldn't even recognize my uh, maternal side, even though I have the substantial maternal tree. And, uh, and it had also identified my uh, step-grandmother as my biological uh, family, even though I very clearly have my biological grandmother in my tree as my biological grandmother. So what did I do? I used this little, um, this little eye down in the corner. Was this useful? I clicked on that. No, this is not useful at all. And I noticed that every time I complained about something, it would take about a week, but then it would be fixed. So 
I do think that Ancestry must have teams of people sitting there looking through these and trying to figure out where are the bugs in this beta version of through lines. And so I, I recommend that if you're having problems that, and still experiencing problems, that you get in there and you complain directly to Ancestry. You can still get back to your DNA circles. So this is similar to through lines, but not the same as through lines. But a lot of people really liked the, um, the DNA circles. Again, this is for Johannes Greiner. And, and my group is the Alma Elizabeth Meyer family group. That was my, uh, my maternal grandmother, my real maternal grandmother. And um, these are the DNA connections that I have with other people and other groups of people. However, all of the sort of great outlines are DNA connections to other people. They don't connect to me, but they all connect to each other. And so you can click on any single one of them and, uh, and you'll see these family groups uh, and how they relate to each other but we're probably all related. So you can go back and get to your through lines if you want. Now, um, moving on to viewing your DNA matches. This is a new screen. This is what it's going to look like after you've enabled the, the new matching features. You're seeing more on the screen than you ever previously could. I also do like the fact that they've compacted it a little more so you can see more people on the screen at once. Um, I think that's an improvement. They, they, I think they used to call them sh shared ancestor hints, I'm not sure, the little green leaves, but now they're called common ancestor. And when you click on one of those, it will actually show you how Ancestry believes that you're related to this person. Again, it's a hint. It's not a, a definite for sure thing. But um, it really is very, very useful. And another thing that's been very interesting with this is some of those locked trees with the, uh, with the green leaves, you can now see how you're related to people. So if you, haven't, if you haven't checked that out, that's kind of interesting. And I would recommend doing it and memorializing it because I'm not sure how long that's gonna last. And certainly some of the people who have their trees private uh, may not realize that if it's private and searchable, that's why this is coming up. So if they go in there and they turn off the searchable feature, you're gonna lose the ability to see that hint. So I would get on there and take a, a good look at, at those, those secret people who you haven't been able to um, identify. So this is me and my dad. That I clicked through to my dad to see how we're related. <laughs> I actually picked this tree because that way I didn't have to privatize anything. Um, there's a little bug over in the corner here though. For some reason, uh, Ancestry fails to recognize that we're also related through my dad's mother, my grandmother. This screen looks different, but the in information is mostly the same. But have you noticed the one thing that's missing that I really don't like? They used to have a long, name, a long list of every surname that's in the tree. I haven't found that, and I'm finding it rather disconcerting that we don't have those, tree, have those names to look at because, uh, yes, Ancestry will show you. Let's see. I've gotten ahead of myself here. Ancestry will show you what the shared surnames are, but if you have a spelling difference, so for example, I have a, a, a surname, Hemaseth, 
H-E-M-E-S-A-T-H in my tree, but an alternate spelling for that is hemisat instead of T-H, T-T. So I'm not going to see if somebody has hemisat in their tree. And now I have to have to go through and look at every single person. And then they might be further back than this five generation tree. And then you've got to click on all those little arrows. And uh, that's kind of a problem. Maybe Ancestry will fix it. We should all complain here today. Um, it is nice that you don't have to click through anymore um, to see how you're related. OK, so here's, here's shared matches. Um, and I have skipped to a different, a different name now, uh, just to show you how useful this might be when you look at your shared matches. So at the very top is my maternal aunt. And so I know that this is a maternal match for me. I've tested my father and my maternal aunt. My mom had already passed away before we started DNA testing. So I know it's maternal. And then I look down the list and I see uh, my DNA cousin, Ernestine. Ernestine and I connected, oh, five years ago and figured out our common family, our Elsasser family. The interesting thing is I found the name Elsesser, E-L-C-E-S-E-R. My Elsasser is E-L-S-A-S-S-E-R. And they were from um, Vinnigan in the southwest falls of Germany. And then I found these El Cessars in Poland. Well, through this match and being able to identify our shared matches, I was able to then go back and do a little more digging and darn if I didn't find out that uh, one of the El Cessars emigrated to Poland in the early 1800s and therefore began the whole Polish branch of the Elsessers that I never even knew existed. Ah, here's the screen I was looking for. Here are those, those shared surnames uh, with, the, with the hemisaths, but this is sharing with my dad. If there was somebody else in the tree it, that I matched with and they were spelling it with the TT, they're not gonna be immediately obvious. The other disimprovement, if there is such a word, um, are shared birth locations. I don't know if you remember how it used to look, but it used to look like this. That's the old version, and this is something that would be worth rolling back um, for me, going back to the, the old version of Ancestry to see this. So, so this is what I see uh, with a group. Uh, I, I do see these shared matches for some Elsassers in Vinnigan, uh, Germany. But what I don't see would be all the other little dots that might have surrounded uh, Vinnigan, where people were born. And a lot of your matches now are going to show up on a map where it shows no common matches. Yes. Up in the corner there you see you can filter by tree. So you can look and see where the birthplaces of your ancestors, you can see the birthplaces of your match's ancestors, and you can, but, if they, but you can't see them overlaid together. And I think that's really, really critical. And this is what I used to find a lot of my, my German birth towns, was looking at my matches and figuring out where did those people cluster. And this is, this is again, here's the old map. Well, my dad matches um, this woman, uh, Gail, and you can see the blue, the, the blue pins represent the birth locations for my dad's ancestors around Osnabrück, Germany. And Gales are there in orange. Well, this is probably where we're gonna match and it's worth my while to explore those surnames rather than any of the other birth locations that she may have shown. 
Now new sorting and filtering. This I do like. This is wonderful. When I was here in November, I talked about the Chrome add-on um, for Ancestry DNA, Ancestry DNA Chrome Helper, and uh, and uh, and another one that also allowed you. The, this was also a, a Chrome add-on, where if you were using the Chrome browser, you had some expanded features. Um, and one of those was color dots. And Ancestry has now, uh, I guess they realized they were missing the boat, but they've added these color dots and they are user defined. So at a glance, if you want, you can assign surnames to those color dots and uh, put them next to your matches. And then rather than having to click and look at their trees and see how you matched or even look at your notes, uh, you're able to see, uh, okay, you know, this is, this is one of my Alcessor matches or this is one of my Stefan matches. Or, and the nice thing is you can filter on them then. So if you want to say, okay, who have I identified as my Alcessor matches? You, you use this all matches. You pick the color up there, click on that, and it's going to pop up all the people that you've identified. I think you can start to see how this might be very useful to you to get back to people that you, that you need to find because you're working on a specific problem. You still have your stars. You can also um, filter by distant matches. Some people need to get to their distant matches, but they have so many fourth cousins, they can't even find their distant matches. So you can click on that. And then, of course, you have common ancestors that you can filter on. From another screen, you're able to, um, to pull down all your, you're still able to get all your new matches. You know, those are the people with the blue dots that you haven't viewed. So, this is, this is now much, much more powerful than it ever was before. Also, new relationship probabilities. And Ancestry, it is about time. If you remember the old one, uh, they used to give you just a very limited number of relationships. They didn't even consider uh, half relationships and they didn't consider uh, once removed relationships. It was, pretty, it was pretty standard, first cousin, second cousin. And now you can click on, um, on the shared, where you, where you see the shared set of Morgans, you click on that little eye, and it'll pop up the chart. I did pass out the DNA detectives relationship chart to everybody because quite frankly, Sometimes I would rather just have that laying on my desk and look at it than have to be toggling between screens. So um, just keep in mind that that might be a more useful way for you to, um, to do your work. And I'm not really sure, I think this is more of a curiosity, but last fall Ancestry rolled out this map and you can see where your where your matches live, um, I, I guess there might be some, um, you know, uh, some value to current location. But of course, it's only going to be for people who've answered the question where they live and agreed to let that be seen. Uh, I find it more of a curiosity than a useful tool. Has anybody found a use for this? Anybody? I actually found a girl that I worked with for years and years. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> was a relative that I had no idea, but she didn't do a tree, so I don't know. Okay, how you're related. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, you do the same thing here. This is the same thing that, that uh, the same sort of thing that Allison was, was talking about. You're going to formulate a question when you're, these are just ancestry tools. You're going to formulate a question, uh, formulate a hypothesis. How is A related to B, for example? Make an educated guess about the answer to that. 
formulate a hypothesis. Well, A is related to B, um, you know, A is the third cousin once removed of, of B. Then identify all the variables, test your statement. Does the shared DNA support the hypothesis? Are there other shared matches to support the hypothesis? So what about the matches of your match? And that's where you want to be able to get in there and see your matches matches. And uh, are there genealogical records to support the hypothesis? And then also don't forget to test if the statement is null. And that's where things like using um, xDNA might be handy because you might be able to disprove something, you know, by that. So do we have time to get into a few of these other tools? Okay, and I'll talk more about these after lunch, but this is just a very quick overview of some of the tools that I've been using recently. The Leeds Method, a way of charting your four grandparents, um, but you can also adapt this to try to identify a, a missing ancestor. So for example, if it's your grandfather that you don't know his four grandparents, if you don't know one of those grandparents, then you may be able to go, use the Leeds method to identify them or to at least help narrow things down. Um, what are the odds? One of my new <laughs> favorite uh, little online programs is uh, from DNA Painter, and it helps you in figuring out the relationship of a person to an ancestor or a pair of ancestors. And of course, that's very helpful when you're trying to work with adoptees. Auto clusters. Have people been seeing auto clusters yet? How many of you are using auto clusters? Okay. Well, that is now available as one of the tier one GEDmatch tools. And it's also, uh, um, it's also connected to my heritage. But if you sign up with Genetic Affairs, uh, they will give you, it's not a free service, but they will give you 400 free credits. They work on credits. They'll give you 400 free credits to sort of test drive it. You don't have to give a credit card or anything, which is, one, which is really wonderful. And, um, and you can, um, see your, you can visually see your shared matches. I'll get into that a little bit more. And then I'm just going to mention Genome Mate Pro because people are always looking for ways to organize their uh, genetic information and that is a free standalone program that you can use. And incidentally, I will, um, I guess, give Nancy a, a link to this and she can email a link to my PowerPoint so that it, it's online with um, Google Sheets. And if anybody wants to go back and, and review this, pro, this uh, presentation and explore it in a little more depth, uh, you can do that. OK, so the Leeds Method. It's a good starting place, especially if you don't know a lot about, about your actual DNA matches. So the, the premise behind it is that you create a chart or a spreadsheet. And uh, this was developed by a woman named Dana Lee Leeds. She does have a simple explanation of how this works on her blog. And I have that link down in the corner there. But you begin with your first match. And you, you want to start with a match who's maybe second cousin or third cousin or greater. You don't, want, you don't want your very closest matches because they're going to match all four of your grandparents. So you start with person A and you say, okay, uh, column B might be your father's father. You can identify these any way you want. Okay, person A is related to, is a cousin uh, related to your father's father. You, Fill that in with a color that you've selected. In this case, it's blue. And then you go and you click on your shared matches for that person. And you say, ah, oh, yes. And they also match person two, person six, and person eight. 
So you color those people in blue. The next step is to go to uh, person three who doesn't have a color assigned yet. You look at color three and you say, ah, yes, I know person three. Person three is, is my father's, is related through my father's mother. So you go through the same process at this point and you click on shared matches. Person three is orange. Person nine is orange. Person 11 is orange. You may not have known that person 11 was related through your, through your father's mother, through your paternal grandmother. And then you keep doing this. You get to, to step four. And now we have your first mother's father's match. And she's made that yellow. Then shared matches are person five, person 10, 12, and 13. And then finally, everything's filled in, and finally, when you get down to person 14, um, you discover that, oh, yeah, well, I haven't filled them out yet because they're related to my, to my mother's mother. So in this case, it's a wonderful example. Everybody is probably exactly who you were expecting. You've got four colors there. Everything's hunky-dory. But what happens when you get this? <laughs> This is somebody that, I've been hel that I'd been helping for a couple of years. We finally solved this a uh, uh, couple of weeks ago, actually on DNA Day, <laughs> on April 25th, DNA Day. Um, I use an imported spreadsheet. I just find that a lot easier, but you can make a manual list if you're not a real techie person. I, I think I downloaded this uh, from um, uh, from DNA Painter. Um, anyway, no, I did it, I did it from auto clustering. That's where it came from. You get, spread, you get three files from, from auto clustering and one of them is a list of all your matches. So I, I, took all of her, I took all of Carol's matches and for a while we knew that something was wrong with her tree. Uh, one thing was, She's 25% Jewish and she didn't know she was Jewish at all. So that was really our first connection was talking about her, her Jewish DNA that she, that she didn't know anything about. So I went through and I found some connections to her mother's mother. For that. I made that column one. I knew there were matches. I started with the mother because I knew that there were matches on the mother's side. So mother's mother, we found some matches. Mother's father, we found some matches. Then we had all these unexplained matches. She had no idea how she was related. So I went and I identified two different names in those matches. I had a project, I, I had a hypothesis that she was descended from, uh, from an Ewald and a Schott, and the Ewald being, being a paternal, uh, you know, great-grandparent and shot being a maternal great-grandparent. And so I identified all of those matches. Well, she's got more matches along those lines than she does on her, on her mother's lines. And nobody showing up at all in her, in her father's column, not for her, her father's side or, her, or for her um, father's mother's side. So in other words, her maternal uh, or her paternal grandparents didn't appear to be who she thought they were. So at first we thought, well, maybe her father was, you know, uh, conceived outside of outside of wedlock. But again, it didn't make sense because we weren't finding matches to her, her father's mother either. That's when I moved on to what are the odds. And this is online at DNA Painter. And I had my hypothesis. And you have to, you create this tree from scratch. So you have to be willing to do a little work here. But uh, it's, it's not hard because you just, you click on the, on the, the starting point and there's a little drop down menu. You just insert a name there. Uh, this one is privatized because of the situation, and that's a feature of what are the odds. 
but I actually had surnames uh, with all of these people. So you put in all of Albert's children. I had, had Burke, Jack, and William. And then I hypothesized, okay, there's a possibility that there's a child out there that I didn't know about. So I, I stuck in an unknown child, uh, an unknown full child, and an unknown half, uh, half, uh, half sibling. So full siblings to Bert, Jack, and William, and half sibling to Bert, Jack, and William. Then I started uh, going down the tree till I reached Carol's DNA matches. And this is where you start plugging in real hard data. And we have Julie who matched her at 385 cent centimorgans, Rick who matched at 378 centimorgans, Doug who matched at 949, and Robert at 640. And then uh, way down there, John at 117. Now we were hypothesizing that Doug was a first cousin, and that's what Ancestry was showing him as being a first to second cousin. Well, it just wasn't working out. The, uh, the red uh, score zero are impossible relationships. DNA painter says, forget it. This doesn't work at all with the numbers you've given me. But the higher the score, the more probable the relationship. So my hypothesis, too, was that maybe Carol was a grandchild of William. And that got me a, a score of, of 80. Um, but hypothesis three was that she was the son, or she was the daughter of William. And that got me a score of 210. And then if I went over to, and tried an unknown half sibling, I only got a score of one. Well, uh, remember what I said, the higher the score, the more likely the relationship. So we were a little bit floored because this would have made William, Carol's father, and she was born while, she, while her mom was married to her dad, the man she thought was her dad, and William is 25 years older than, than her mom. So we really aren't quite sure how William came to be her father. There's very good possibility, though, that she was donor conceived because her mom used to always tell her about how desperately she wanted a baby, and she was born six years into the marriage. So we're thinking, but we will probably never know, but we have now concluded that William was Carol's father. He also was part Jewish, and additionally, when I went to GEDmatch and looked at Carol's X matches, I discovered that her X matches were predominantly Jewish names. So uh, that could not have been passed down from William or any of those sons to her father and then to her. She could have only gotten that directly from her dad. And that's how we were able to conclude her misidentified parental event. This is auto-clustering, and it's just a different way of looking at your shared matches. And this is one that I ran for my, my maternal aunt. Uh, each one of those little groupings represents people who are, are shared match groups. The little gray dots that you see around the edges are, they not only match in the colored groups, but they may match one of your other matches. So if there's a lot of endogamy or pedigree collapse, uh, this might look very, very different. You might have one big clump, one big cluster, 
So if, if you have a lot of endogamy, uh, this is not something that, that I necessarily recommend for you. Because, and then you'll have the gray dots just all clumped around the, all clumped around the sides. But, oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's intermarriage within a population. Forgive my background in anthropology, but, uh, I, and actually it's been pointed out to me that pedigree collapses may be a, a better term. Uh, typically, I think endogamy is when people marry within, within their own, marry their own relatives on purpose. And uh, pedigree collapse is more when you pretty much have a limited number of partners and you're eventually going to marry your, you know, your second or your third cousin and then you end up with uh, fewer, an fewer ancestors, few, less ancestral diversity than you might have expected. Uh, what's interesting to me looking at this visually is I don't even have to look at the names, which show up around the sides there, so you can cross-reference who's related to who. But uh, the group up above are my German ancestors who came to the United States in the 1800s and settled around Ohio and Indiana. And you can see that there is some overlap that they've intermarried, and that's something that I found out. You know, occasionally I will find someone who is related to me on both my father's side and on my mother's side. It doesn't mean that they, you know, my mother and father aren't related, but these, you know, uh, for example, these German Catholic families probably had a limited pool of people that they could, could marry within. Now, they, now, down below here then, you see these tiny, tiny clusters. They're so little. Those are the people I don't know and I can't figure a lot about. They represent my, my maternal grandfather's side. He was from Saxony and he came over in 1912. And of course, there have been very limited resources because that was behind the Iron Curtain up until the Berlin Wall fell. And uh, a lot less DNA testing there. Uh, those people, uh, the older people still don't necessarily speak English, the younger people do, but uh, it's a lot more difficult to get information out of that region, and my clustering represents that visually. Oh, and one other thing about this, when you get these auto clusters, uh, when you scroll down the page, you have all of this information by name and groups and even a link to uh, either you can uh, do this from Ancestry, you can do it from Family Tree DNA, and uh, as I mentioned, it comes with the uh, GEDmatch feature, and uh, it's worth playing around with, especially with 400 free credits, because it's only 25 uh, credits per report. So you can run a lot of reports before you run, before you run out of free credits, and uh, it, it's a fun tool. All right, the last thing is just a quick mention of Genome Mate Pro. Uh, I'm, as I said, it's something that you download. It's a standalone uh, uh, program. It's pretty complicated. Has anybody here used this? Okay, I haven't used it a lot either, uh, but I was able to successfully download from GEDmatch. You can use, uh, you can download from 23andMe, FTDNA, um, from GEDmatch, uh, either tier, um, tier one or from Genesis Basic or the Classic. And uh, you can't directly use, bring Ancestry into this, but there's yet another um, company that for a, a small fee will allow you to subscribe. It's called DNA GEDCOM Client, and it's another way that, you, and they will interface with Genomate Pro. 
I'm, prob I'm probably going to give that a little whirl and see how it works because apparently it gives you really, really in-depth access to your ancestry data. So all of your matches, you can be able to download all your matches. And then you can put them into a, a spreadsheet like this. And uh, over there on the right, it'll show you uh, the, uh, the, the centimorgans that you match with somebody and, and the SNPs. This, is, this came from, from GEDmatch. But I really haven't quite had the energy <laughs> to, to, to explore this in great depth. And like I said, it's pretty complicated, but if you're really, really into it, it might be something you want to know about. Okay, well, thank you for your time. I hope that I pass along something that's useful to someone today, and I hope that uh, I didn't bore those of you who might already have known all of this. So, okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm getting really confused with um, staying on track and keeping my um, information organized. Um, so, I mean, what is the best way to keep this information organized? And if you're an ancestry user, right? Ancestry. Yes. Well, first question is, what information can't you keep organized? Is it the DNA information or is it the tree organization or the... the DNA. The sources. Sources, my notes. <laughs> I'm scattered because I'll have someone. I'll be working on one line on this with one go in mind and then someone else pops up and asks the question about the um, another ancestor. Ah, you are like me. You are a DNA opportunist. <laughs> but I, I, my feelings are grab those opportunities because if some somebody pops up, you know, you don't know on any given day is somebody going to stop making their DNA public. Uh, um, I just keep those notes in my tree or one of my many trees, as I said, I don't necessarily have just one tree. I have one big tree uh, that is pretty much all my confirmed ancestors, or at least as confirmed as I can get them at this point. But um, then I have, those, I have those various DNA trees, and those I do separate into maternal, paternal, husband's line, uh, you know, my mother-in-law's line. Uh, but I try to keep them in notes um, and use the various tags. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how detailed your data is that you're trying to organize. And I have paper files too. I still have paper files. I will, I will print things out. Gosh darn it. <laughs> but then, how do you organize and sort those? That's part of my struggle. Well, it's still file folders and by surname. I pretty much organize it by surname. How about you? I have two huge legal file folder drawers <laughs> and a letter size file cabinet that has four drawers. And I organize them by uh, surname. I also organize them by uh, so I, I don't just print once, I might print twice or three times three because <laughs> I will organize them by date. And then I get into having to say, well, I, I can't really find this line by going direct. So I'm going to go, I found a brother or I found a sister that I can follow. So I'm following that line. So I have a cross reference to that line. Does that make sense? I used to keep it in a notebook. See, that's what I'm using it now, but I still can't find. Well, th that's just it. You know, in the notebook, it's on a page. You know? And when I first started DNA, I used a notebook. I wrote down all the people's GEDmatch numbers that I was interested in and what uh, chromosome and what segment I matched on. And it, didn't, didn't, it was going through and trying to find it. So now I actually file them by chromosome and segment. 
And one other thought about what I do is my backup is actually to the paper is actually the computer. I have the file folders on the computer because they're going to be searchable. So you want to make sure you give everything good file names so that if you're, you're needing to go back and reference the, you know, the Civil War discharge papers of your great, great, great grandfather Miller, you've given enough information in, in your file name that you can find it almost like that. So. Well, I read recently a book about, uh, there's a program called Evernote, and you can get oh, a, yeah. you can get it for either PC or Mac, and then you can also get mobile versions for like iPhone, iPad, Android, whatever. And a lot of, uh, actually somebody published a book that's available on Amazon Kindle that explains how to use Evernote for genealogy because it has this really intricate like tagging system and notebook system and everything and you can just you know search for anything in inside the document too not just the file name. I'm and currently you using Evernote as okay. my um, main organization but if I have like a million notebooks scattered of the information that I have yet to put in Evernote and now I can't find that information. Tags. Um, tags will be your best and, um, So I keep all my documents on Evernote, all my pictures belonging to that one person, and each notebook has a surname. And then within that is a link to their mother or father within Notebook. So I don't have to go and search. I can just hit that link to that father's name, and then the father pops up. Yeah, a lot of professional, I've heard a lot of professional genealogists use Evernote. But my thing is staying focused and getting everything onto Evernote. And That's always the hardest part is all the diligence of the documentation, the organizing and the documenting. Um, I put everything that I know is factual um, on Wikitree because, you know, I have no grandchildren. My Neither one of my children had children. So nobody really is going to want a lot of the research I did. So I put it on Wikitree so that it's there from that point on. And I think I have Wikitree. Oh, wow, look, there's Wikitree. <laughs> and so I'm going to sit down and show you. Like your choice of family, that's one of mine, too. Gil? Can I, can I ask a real quick question? Uh, how are you getting to Roots Web now? Somebody talked about, I don't do Roots Web. It's I back up though, I used it the other day. How, a lot how of are you times when you just go, go out like on Google and you search, some of the old Roots Web will actually pop up for old discussions and everything. Through and through and history and the web search and it's still one of the things. That's why I know that ain't working anymore, but and I hit it. I think it's what back. they did, they had it archived it's pieces. Yeah, I think they have they have all of the old files and stuff archived so you can do a Google search and find what you need. Okay. Thank you. All right, this is what you do. <coughs> All right, Wikitree is free. You can donate if you want, but you don't have to. You can build your tree here. They, it's a European, uh, sort of Scandinavian-based site, mm -hmm. so they expect you to follow the rules. If you don't, you might get your hands smacked. <laughs> and they do it publicly. <laughs> 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 but it really, make, it really improves the way you document your tree. <coughs> As you can see here, this is Robert Morris Gillespie. I have his biography. <coughs> I have his timeline. Wow. I have his 1812 letter saying, give me my money I served. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I put that there. So I don't have to worry about having a file folder for him at my house. Uh, he's completely documented. My sources are documented. And the great thing that I like about Wikitree is the people who've gone on Wikitree and they, their tree links to this tree. This is a, an adoptee that we found through DNA. Hmm. She was adopted from the descendants of uh, Robert Moore's husband. And, and you, you did all that work. Yes. You did all of that. Mm -hmm. Very good. And well, they, like I said, they're Scandinavian. 
<laughs> so it's order, is it a temple? Well, I've even found yes, problems with it. Yes, it's a temple. But all yes, yes, you do. But they will eventually get you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, it takes them a year or two. <laughs> if you want to add somebody before 1700, I think mm -hmm. it is, you have to go through a a, uh, a training course, a training course mm -hmm. and complete their little training course online before they will certify you to be permitted to add one well, before 1700. Is this so, part of Wikipedia? It's, uh, no, it's not part of Wikipedia, but it's the same. Concept. Same concept. Yeah, it's public. It, it's public. It, it's open source. We, we all own it. Yeah, okay. and we all can make changes unless if somebody keeps. I had someone who kept making a change to one of my profiles because they insisted that Robert Morris Gillespie's father was Robert Gillespie from Caswell, Virginia, and I happened to know who his father was. I have everything. I'm going to get that proof. So I had them go in and tell that person we're locking you off this profile. So, so how, how, see, my um, William Sandy ancestor was married to Dinah. He lived in the county. His son William, my ancestor, lived in the county. He didn't die, you know, till 1840, that kind of thing. Well, then there's a group, and there were like three William Sandys in the 1700s mm -hmm. living in Virginia. Well, then there's this North Carolina William Henry Sandy group who keeps claiming my William Sandy and on, Nina. On Wikitree? On everywhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> on Wikitree, on everywhere. Well, and I have sent um, Wikitree all the documentation that I've been able to find saying, listen, they, are, they did descend from a William Sandy, but even in their records, they say he was from here. Here's your William Sandy who lived down there. So Wikitree changed it, and then the last time I looked, they had changed it back again. Then make another complaint. So it Can you also have also two separate it, trees? Also put it under, enter your public comment here. This is not the William Sand, Sandy who lived <coughs> in North Carolina in blah, 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 whatever day. Just put it in the public comments. Mm -hmm. So that they stop, because what happens is when you're adding, adding someone, it pops up with matches. And they're probably just clicking that match. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they can make their own comments then? You can make your own comments. I mean, the person that's looking at that. Yes, they can make comments too. As you see. With, like we can get it real So, So is this your own tree, or is it like um, a family <coughs> search where it's a community? It's a community tree. This is a community tree. Wiki tree is a community tree. Mm -hmm. yeah, they call it like their idea, they call it like one world tree. So the idea behind it is that each individual person has one profile. So they're trying to make it to where, like, you know, you don't get a bunch of discrepancies with trees so, so that, you know, each individual person gets their own. And they have contests <clears throat> throughout the year where you go on and you try to clean up profiles. And if you see someone's really documented and <coughs> sit over here that this is not the William Sandy from North Carolina, they may go in and, and correct that. They reward you with badges they, for yeah. doing various things. <laughs> <laughs> Never money, but you get badges. <laughs> <laughs> so we're really, really competitive. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> right. It's great when you're up at 2 o'clock in the morning and you're texting each other saying, I got more than you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The other good thing about Wikitree now is with DNA. It's linked to GEDmatch. So this is Kristen. And I can compare Kristen, right? I'm going to add another, jet, I'm going to add my GEDmatch number, T456636. T456636. Click Add. Click Compare. Now I have to log in to <coughs> GEDmatch. This is the part I hate. Oh, you wasn't on their Yes, if I wasn't on their computer, I had to say. I was not doing much. Log in. And 
and you can see that Kristen and I match on chromosome <coughs> 3 for 8.9 centimorgans and chromosome 4 for 15.4. Right. That's a complete amount. And we don't, I know we don't match on any others, but you can go down and see. And this is where the better. The blue the better. The bluer and the greener, the better. But that's not likely to happen unless you're doing siblings. Right? So does that, does that mean <laughs> a woman is or is it not? It is. The blue one is showing where you definitely match the other person. Oh, okay. And as long as it's over 7 cm. And the, the, okay. the yellow color means a half identical match. The green is full of So that's what I like about the uh, wiki tree. Now, you know, so you can do that. And then you can switch right over to wiki tree since I know I have someone else on Jed, Jed match that matches us on that same chromosome and I do my DNA triangulation. And then I file that in the notebook of successful DNA. It's not gotten that long. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to explain that there is this tool that you can store things on. And it's a public tree. And yes, people can change it, and you can't lock it down. Okay. But you, it has to be public so it can be shared. <coughs> some of the language that, like especially in your presentation where you're trying to give us some basics and some mm -hmm. background, that sort of left me in the dust. So <coughs> where can I go to learn more about that? Blaine Bettinger's. OK, I wrote that down. Okay. DNA book. Okay. Well, um, I have a different way of doing it, although I have the books. But if you're a Facebook user, there are genealogical and DNA Facebook groups for just about anything you can imagine. So most of them are private groups. You have to ask to join. And some of them require you to answer questions before they'll take you. It, it might be as simple. So I belong to a bunch of area special interest groups like Mecklenburg, Germany, but I also belong to uh, a bunch of DNA groups. The first one I joined was DNA Detectives. That's why I call myself a DNA Detective. Yeah. That group now, I think they have over 40,000 members at this point, people who read it regularly. Blaine Bettinger is the moderator for DNA tips, and I think it's called tips and techniques. I wouldn't swear to it. But that is one of the best groups that I belong to. Because every time he hears about something new, he typically will get on Facebook, his Facebook group, and, and tell the group about it, because he's so excited. Is that the so, DNA detective group? No, it's, it's DNA tips, and I think it's but I, I can check my tablet Facebook for sure with the exact name. But just, you know, if you start with DNA tips, it'll probably pop up and, and you'll see the group. And it's also a very large group, but it's a large group of extremely interested people. And they tend to be, some of the groups can be a little snitty. It seems to be a pretty good group. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I enjoy it a lot. And he posts, uh, he'll post his videos there when he does some videos too. So if he's got something new, he's going to announce it to that group mm -hmm. first. I belong to that group too. <laughs> and ancestry DNA matching is awesome. And there's a lot of brand new people that come on That's there. That's a Facebook group? Yeah. <clears throat> what is it? Ancestry DNA? There are also DNA registry groups on Facebook. So if you have a JED number, they're private. So when you ask to join, they'll ask you questions. You have to answer. And then you, uh, including giving your JED match number for their database. And then there's a tool called a match book tool. And then you enter your JED match number and do it, and it does a search into that matchbook, and it does a search and finds everyone in that 
particular DNA registry group, Irish, Scottish, <coughs> whatever, any member in that group that is a match to you. So, for example, I, I manage one. I manage the uh, Matchbox group, or mat, it's also called Matchmaker because it's, they use two names for it. Um, so, I manage that for the for the Mecklenburg group, and it really is a cool thing because when you go to your if you're using JetMatch and you go to that long, long list of people who match you, you know, in my case, where I know. Um, exactly how my top, say, 50 to 100 matches on, on, uh, on Ancestry.com, you know, how they're related to me. I don't have that clear of an idea with the, with the people on GEDmatch, and an awful lot of them don't have GEDcom, so, <coughs> so it can be really difficult to find commonality among them. But, uh, I decided that I would take on the responsibility of, of adding matchmaker slash matchbox to the Mecklenburg Germany group. And boy was I rewarded because my only match ended up being along a line where I had not been able to 100% confirm that that this Frank family that I had identified the right person as my great great grandmother. I just wasn't positive. And the reason I wasn't positive was for good reason. I didn't have an exact birth date for her. And if it was her, she changed her name from uh, Henrika to Friedrika. Why she did that, I have no idea. But I got a kiss with a man whose last name was Prong. But it turned out uh, when I said, you know, who I thought my Prang family was, he said, oh yeah, you're related by da 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 da. And, uh, and until then, I really wasn't sure. Now, granted, I had looked at every single Prang within, you know, a 500 mile radius, but. Uh, it seems like I probably have made the correct identification, and she just changed her name. So I have um, a problem when I'm doing detective work, and sometimes localities, because West Virginia and Virginia being so close, and Greenbrier County being near there and everywhere. So, is there a good site or a good place where you can get uh, broke down by the years? What counties were what? In the yes, there is. There is a site that you can go to that has the county formations year by year for Virginia and Virginia. And it will show you as they're coming into transition period and um, once they've completely formed. Hold on a second, I'll get you this. I know some I've come up with things like Augusta County or Augusta or something in here <coughs> on the Ohio River. You know, but at one time it really was. Yeah, Augusta, Augusta was all the way from um, just right at the Shenandoah Valley, mm -hmm. all the way into Ohio and Illinois country. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, I know Augusta my really family took up was here. Why is it saying here and there? And there's there's a program too by Goldbug, is the name of the group that sells it, and it's. Goldbug, and it's Annie Map A N I M A M P, and I don't know. It was maybe like a hundred dollars or something. And and the people who sell it, I mean, it's like a little mom and pop shop, mm -hmm. but it's got the map of the United States <coughs> from when they first came to America, and it goes by year, or you can pick it by state or whatever. Mm -hmm and it shows the formation of it year by year by year. It's really awesome. Any map is online at the site that Andrew is going oh, to Oh, is it online there? Yeah. Okay. Internationally? Mm hmm So, <coughs> for example. Uh, it's, it's just, they just do the United States as oh, far as okay. I know. Okay, so it's not going to help me figure out when Prussia changed from uh, Prussia here to Prussia here. So. You're better off being in a Facebook group. Too. She can't find something. Find out. Okay. 
that's, that's for Virginia. You can go to the different states. Right, so, so I had found it online before and then it quit working. So what website are you finding it on? It's www.mapofus.org. I use this map a lot. Yeah. And that is the anti right there. program. That's it. That's it. Yes. What is that? That is the anti map yeah. program. That, that's it right there. Can you do it? It contains everything that any map has. You can go through I had found that and it worked here. But that's wor that one's working? Yeah. Yeah, it's working. Now, I'm not, uh, years ago, there, it went through a different site. And then all of a sudden, you couldn't bring up Virginia anymore. Right. You could bring up a few other states, but not Virginia. Uh -huh. And then I kept looking and looking and looking and finally found this where it's interactive again. Okay. Yeah, because that's awesome. I can't, can you give that website again? I can't read it. It's maps what? Map, map of US. Map of US dot org. org. Mm -hmm. Slash Virginia. US dot org. If you, if you type mm -hmm. in Google, maps. Virginia mm -hmm. County Formation Map. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Or you can buy it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, this lets you overlay the census, which is neat, okay? Oh, that's good. All right. But no, I just had a problem. Um, someone's, we all was in Hampshire County, but there was no record of them elsewhere. They're in that little, they were in that little section of Hampshire, Hardy, Grant, Frederick, they kept flipping back and forth for 12 years. Yeah. So their records are all over. <laughs> well, and, and when you live close like that, it depended on what census taker, depended mm -hmm. on what county you're getting accepted <clears throat> into. Like some of them would go and be like, oh, well, this is Canal. Mm -hmm. And then the next year they'd go, oh, well, this is Putney. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it just, it, it really was a, a variation. I had one ancestor, he, he was in, Three or four different counties in like a succession of uh, uh, things like, man, why are you moving all over the place? And then I found this, and he never moved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I, have, I have a question. How do you start your German research? Okay. <laughs> because I had my second great grandmother came to the U.S. in 1892 from a little town that no longer exists, Ebling. Um And it's a very uncommon last name. That's the last, the last name? No, that's the where challenge. they came, the last name is Bandish. Okay. So, they say the first thing you need to do, and I'm sure you've already done this, is make sure you've got absolutely everything you can get from the United States before you try to jump across. But again, I've gotten a lot of help from the different groups that I join. Um, I belong to the uh, Lower Saxony group and when I was on there, I was I was still trying to figure out, my maiden name is Beerman, I was trying to figure out where did my Beermans come from. I, I All I knew from all of the research in the United States was that they came from Hanover. Well, that's another one of those big, you know, kind of catch-all uh, identifications. You know, it's not the town, the city of Hanover in, in uh, Lower Saxony. It's basically most of Lower Saxony. So I got on there. I did have, I did have a birthday for, for my dear man. And I got on there and asked, because these are, these are often multilingual, although sometimes they're not. Uh, but it's a multilingual group. I got on and I asked in English, "How do I find my my uh, William Joseph Spearman, my Wilhelm Joseph Spearman, born in such and such a date, 1932, probably somewhere in?" the region of Osnabrück. Now I had at least kind of narrowed it down by looking at my, my matches that were close to the Hanover region. And I saw an awful lot of them clustering around that town. But I had no idea which town to look in. Well, darn it, they didn't come back and say to me, hey, I'm going to be in the 
at the archives, at the Catholic archives two weeks from now, I will go look for you. And she did. And she came back and she said, yes, I found him, his name, his father was, uh, was Christian uh, Beerman Genan Connersman. So in other words, the name had actually changed. The reason I couldn't find any surname matches in my DNA was because in this particular air region of Germany, uh, we were we were discussing this earlier. The uh, the surname follows property rights. So if a man marries a woman and the woman has the property, then this man will adopt the female surname. So that's exactly what happened to my family. Uh, we were in Beerman's until just before we came to the United States, and that's why I could never find it. So when she got into the actual Catholic record, she found it, she found the town that he was from, and from there it just all exploded. She actually did several generations of research on that. So then I went back and I asked her again. I became Facebook friends with her. We discovered we have a lot of common interests. We chat back and forth. And every now and then, I won't overtax her, but every now and then I'll be like, did you look for one for ancestor? There's <laughs> one <laughs> But that's how I found one, but that's not necessarily what worked for others. So, uh, you know, there's just a, if you join these groups, there's like a big general <coughs> German genealogy group that you just have no idea what regions are even looking at. And don't get on and expect someone to always just say, oh, yeah, I can. I can look that up for you. So that's going to be probably the exception rather than the, rather than the rule. I have a question. <coughs> I was adopted. <coughs> I found out who my mother was, but she wouldn't tell me anything. So I did the DNA. <coughs> and there were stories that my adopted family told me after I was 40. They're gone now, so I feel free to do it. I did the DNA. And the person that she told me, I've got DNA connection. I've got what I think maybe it's his grandmother. It's called they call it a first cousin. I've got second cousins and third cousins, but I can't mail it to him. <laughs> I've got grandparents, great grandparents. We've even gone to the cemeteries, found the graves. I'd love a picture. Oh, yeah. Because everybody's dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's sometimes just getting lucky to get the picture. But are you? You're sure though that? that I don't see how it could not be. Right. Because the, the grandparents, the great grandparents. Right. Then this well, what I would do, because it's not just what are you share those grandparents, but it's the size of those matches. Well, and for you, the what are the odds would be the perfect little program. Build out the tree from what are the odds? So that would, it, and it comes that from the DNA painter. But you, that was uh, the tree that I showed you earlier. I wrote that down too. Yeah. I, I would I would fill that out and see what are the odds. Okay, you, it, it should give you an answer, but you've got to come up with various hypotheses. It, it won't work if you just put one person in as your hypothesis. You have to have multiple hypotheses. So you say, you know, okay, this guy's my my father, or what if this person from a different branch is my father? And then you have to plug in all of your matches and the numbers of stuff organs for those matches, and it's going to spit back to you, you know, probability-wise. And you you might get a clearer picture. You might say, okay, you know, this person is. I had one that came up. This person is two thousand five hundred and ninety-two times more likely than your next option. <laughs> I said, Okay. Well, I have a second cousin that we share grandparents and a third cousin, the great grandparents, but this one that just popped up about a month ago and she does not have a tree, but our <coughs> CMs, mine with her is 990. Wow. wow. That's, wow. A, that's, so that's a pretty
where you get hit. That and would, <laughs> that's, that's probably a first cousin, but as I was showing you earlier, the one uh, with Carol, with the, with the misattributed father, and um, she got one, she got a mask, and he was 900 and something like 948 centimorgans, and that's what we were thinking, first cousin, first cousin, but then we discovered he's, she is actually his half aunt. So um, look at that chart that I passed out earlier, and that will give you guidelines, because if you just go by the little, the little label at the top of Ancestry, they're going to say first and second cousin. Uh, if you click on that new uh, little information icon, right, if you click on the little information icon, you'll see that there are a whole range of uh, possible relations. And you've got to consider all those possible relationships. And in fact, Blaine Betterger was warning the other day, he said, just because this says that there's only a 5% chance that this is the relationship, he said, some of, you, some of those people are going to be in the 5%, so don't rule it out. Don't disregard the 5% possibility. No, it's not the most likely, but it could still be the one that's true. Well, this was so exciting to me. I mean, that's all I could think about oh, for yeah. a couple of weeks. And I said, I'm going to grow to this computer. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty exciting. Thank you. Um, one of you said, and I think it was, I don't know who said this, maybe you, uh, to um, have a a burning question, that's not the word you used, but to have, to, to know specifically what you're going after. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have any real big burning questions. Oh, then you're done. You <laughs> 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 the end of everything. The thing I can do is just like pick out one side of the family and say, okay, who were my great, great, great grandparents and start mm -hmm. there and then just see where it takes me. Right. Is that what you That's mean? usually what I'm doing. I'm usually, just, I actually, you know, the, you should form a hypothesis, you know, you should have goals, I know how you said, know what your research goals are. But at any given time, your goal is typically always to either prove something that you haven't been able to prove, to learn more about the people that you do know about. I mean, I'm big on using um, newspaper articles to try and understand what kind of lives they led. Um, I want to know how do I match all of my matches. Um, I want to know every interesting thing I can about people. I mean, I, I covered some, my, my husband calls me dirt digging devil wife. <laughs> 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 because, of, well, I, I did discover that his third great grandfather was a convicted felon and that he was, he was transported from, from, um, from Yorkshire, England to Australia oh. and, 14, and did 14 years in, 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 at hard labor in Australia. Now, the family knew that he had gone to Australia, but they thought he'd gone there voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually found the uh, newspaper account of his arrest. This was in, 18, in, in 1832. Uh, I noticed he was missing in the, in the 1840 census, that he wasn't there with his wife, but the family story had been that he went with his wife to Australia in 1859. It turns out just she went to Australia to join him in 1859. That must have been some reason. But um, in the meantime, she'd been a bigamist and married somebody else. So. <laughs> So you know, there's just there's always new stuff to learn, and make it make it an adventure. Pick somebody that you think might be interesting and focus on them, and see if you can find out any anything that's tasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we all had some someone in our family who's an oddity. You know, um, I have a death certificate for my great great grandfather's sister, where it says her mother says she's no relation. Oh, that's interesting. Uh -huh. yes. well, well, her mother should know. <laughs> and what I found through DNA is, that's right, I, he more than likely was not, those 
They lived beside a courthouse. He was a tailor and a shoemaker. I believe he took in a child from the courthouse to raise as his son. Aww. But, you know, I would not have known that. We would just said, oh, he's from the Isle of Man, and blah, 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 because that's where the paper trail shows you. But then when you get into the DNA and you wonder why you're not coming up with matches, and you dig a little deeper, say, what's going on around this person? Not always <coughs> nefarious. No, not <laughs> I, I have some of those. My aunt who did our first day in the tree locked those branches off. <laughs> she pruned that tree. I really love those trees. I'm supposedly, well, if I can find the right link to Jesse James. But I found out that if he did fake his death, he learned it from his father. His father mm -hmm. went to California and mm -hmm. faked his death to get out of marriage to Jesse James' mother and remarried, came back under a different name and remarried, married another woman, a younger woman. And he talked to me, I've got a grandpiece of his sister living with him. Have you heard about art, by the way, have you heard about artifact DNA? Yes, I'm so excited. Yeah, okay. so, uh, so this was something I had heard uh, about from Blaine Bettinger when he posted it to the group. They are now making headway with testing the DNA off of things, things like envelopes and stamps. So imagine if you have a letter that was written by your great grandmother to someone in your family and you came into possession of it and you have the envelope for it or a postcard that came over from Germany, you potentially can send this to a testing service to see if there's any viable DNA on it. Now, the caveats are it is super expensive right now. I, I think I'm hearing something like the neighborhood of $500, something like that. Um, and uh, Blaine Bettinger said, don't expect it to come down a lot in price, the way, uh, the way ancestry, the, uh, the way testing, you know, you know, spit testing or swab is, because it's a lot more labor intensive to actually do the process. You also need to know that whatever you send them will be destroyed in the process. But they, you know, so like if you're sending them the flap of an envelope, they're not going to destroy the whole letter. All they need is, is the part where, where it's lit. That's what they're looking for, something with saliva on it. I thought maybe hairs would be good, but I heard that if you don't have the root of the hair, there's not likely to be any viable thing. But imagine now, if you know for certain that this letter was, you know, written by and most likely sealed by this specific ancestor, you can now leapfrog back several generations, and there's just all kinds of possibilities. Haven't tried it yet, but Google it and. See that there's stuff out there about it. 1970s and 80s, my aunt was the postmaster at Nellis, and most of the older people didn't like the taste so of the stamps. She licked all the stamps. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> she's going to come back as the mud. It's going to be my aunt, and I'll take everybody. But <laughs> you're going to think of that because they really, those old well, ladies would lick them stamps. Yeah. And, and keep, it, keep in mind, you're going to probably know them when you start getting those matches back. If you're related to her, Instead of the people you were expecting, it Ask them if they have a postmaster in their family. Yeah. <laughs> or the how, how far, okay, the, the DNA segments. Okay, let's say how far back are they reliable? Is there a certain period, like five generations? They pretty much say it, it, they will not go beyond eight generations. About eight generations? Yeah. That's the correct. And then it gets, it, the it, 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 yeah. Six to eight. It, you were saying, that, okay, there's the, you were talking at the beginning where you had, could do the mail and they were, and it, it, okay, for me to have my brothers do it, would that be yeah, something that, that would make it easier? Yeah, that's going to be the same line. I had my father do YDNA, it's obviously, I can't. 
couldn't get me anything. Uh -huh. It wasn't related to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're good in there. On oh, no. Family Tree DNA, they have those Y groups. Um, can women enter those Y groups if they have a cousin that tests? Well, I put my cousin up there. He didn't do it. You know, as long as you have a male who's testing. But you can put a male one in your family. It's for the male members of the family. It's on family tree DNA. Okay. What have you got in there, Nancy? Uh, I'm passing out your X DNA okay. information. And if any of you have I've already uploaded it to the map and want to take a look at this while we're talking about it. So I'm going to let her take over for a little bit and sit down. <laughs> well, I'm going to sit there and use the computer. This is the one I just downloaded yesterday. Really? She didn't know she's going to have to come here and work. <laughs> interested in that uh, Facebook group with Blaine Bettinger, it's actually Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques. That is the correct name of that group. Can you repeat so, it, please? It's Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques. So, so on Facebook, if you just go up to the search bar and put that in, It'll pop up and you should see a way once you get to the group itself to join in. And what was his name again? Blaine Bettinger. He's the guy who wrote the book that they've been recommending as well. And Ancestry DNA Matching is another one that, uh, that I belong to. Is there a 